All right, so let me be the first to say good afternoon uh, to you today. Um, I am going to, just as the two gentlemen before me, they kind of have built me up to this point. We've looked at the subgrade, we've looked at how we get the thickness, but then we're gonna go just beyond that. Because we know that we can get the right thickness and we can get um, the soil uh, you know, placed correctly, but if we don't do the construction portion correctly, then we can potentially have some issues. Um, so we're going to look at jointing specifically and some other uh, curing, other ways of uh, on the, con the construction side. So I'm going to skip through, for the interest of time, the first uh, couple slides. Basically, this is just reiterating what both of the gentlemen have said before me. The ACI uh, 325 guide, the 12, it takes into these, uh, the consideration and it pulls information from these other um, documents that are out there uh, from ACI and their... Um, there's, other, some other, there's also some other design guides that are out there. This is a, um, a bulletin put out uh, by ACPA on the construction of joints of concrete streaks. So there are specific um, design guides or construction bulletins that are out there for these specific topics that are out there. Uh, the Iowa State, the CP Tech Center also has a, a guide that is out there for you. Um, just like anything else, any of the other books that come from the CB Tech Center, very easy uh, to maneuver on the website. So if this is something that you would like to look up, uh, you can go to the CP Tech Center, just Google it, and then they have a search function on there. Um, but another good uh, document to use uh, for jointing. So we know that when concrete is going through the drying uh, stage, it's starting to get in the hardened process, it, it starts shrinking, it has a volume change. And so the volume change is what causes the cracking to occur in the concrete pavement. If we look at a slab in itself, if we take the slab and we place it on rollers, not very realistic. I personally don't want to walk on a slab that's sitting on rollers and I don't want to build a building on it either. But if we have a slab in that scenario where there's no, con no constraints, there's not the friction from underneath, there's no um, edge constraints, or, and it's not connected to a building or anything like that, um, then we're not going to have the restraints that it's going to happen whenever, um, you know, causing the cracking. It's when we put that slab on the floor, on the ground, and we actually have the friction that, that occurs between the slab and the soils, um, or if it is up against a, a building or some other type of structure, we, get, we go through that shrinkage um, volume change, and that's where we start getting the, the cracking, to, uh, and that's where it starts occurring. Um, so looking at that, we're going to look at joint spacing. Um, before I get started, this is my trick question. Um, I do a lot of uh, talks on ACI 330. I'm, I'm a, really a parking lot um, uh, girl. But um, do you, can you tell me the difference between um, a joint and a crack? And this is a trick question. Kind of. One, one's pretty and one's not pretty. If an owner sees a crack, they think their pavement's completely failed, right? If they see a joint and it looks, it's pretty and it's expected. It's what, it, you know, it almost looks like a crack is, is an accident. Um, but really they're, they're very one and the same. We, we control that, we make it look pretty with a, with a saw cut or another form of a joint, but then a crack um, actually happens below. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. But there's really a couple of things when we, call, we get called out to a site and look at jointing and, and cracking, there's really a couple of things that we can measure. We can measure the horizontal distance. We can measure the depth. One thing that we cannot measure is the time, as far as we take somebody's word on when they actually uh, made those cuts. And so we're going to look at each of those here in, into more detail. This picture right here is of a, about a four, four and a half inch thick pavement. Um, and, and if anybody knows their concrete design, um, for parking lots, your maximum joint, joint spacing is going to be um, 10 feet. Well, if you know a standard uh, parking stall is typically 9 feet by 18 feet deep. If you look at this parking stall, we actually have two parking stalls here. And as far as I can tell, there's no joints cut in that. So that looks like this particular slab is at least 18 feet wide and 18 feet deep. And look what the concrete did. It cracked right in the pretty much mid-panel. So it's looking about that nine-foot uh, location. So um, again, if an owner walks out and sees this, somebody's going to get a phone call that their, their pavement has actually is failing. And it's not. It's just it is, it's those stresses building up. And that's what we get instead of a, a clean, pretty joint. So our horizontal spacing is very, very important. It's one of those things that can be measured. 
So the recommendations are between two and two and a half times your thickness of your pavement in feet. So if you've got a four inch thick pavement, I mentioned earlier two and a half times four is 10 feet maximum to pull back from your maximums. Um, there are so many reasons and, and uh, benefits from doing that. One of those being that um, if there's engineers in the, in the room, we know that we can put on our plans, this is where that manhole is gonna go in the ground, but how likely is that manhole gonna go in that exact location? Probably pretty slim. It's gonna be off one way or the other. And so if we pull back from our maximums, it allows for some um, changes in the field to be made. We also want to keep those um, panels as square as possible. And I know um, if there's any architects in the room, I, I apologize, but it seems like some of the layouts are getting really, really ornate and detailed, really trying to slow down that traffic flow. And so when you get a lot of curves and, and things like that, landscape islands, it gets really, really hard um, to make those joints uh, as square as possible. Trust me, eight hours looking at a Walmart parking lot can make you go bonkers. And there's a way to really avoid some of these, these uh, crazy panels. So um, it's going to happen. Uh, it's just where is the best location for those uh, ratios to be broken. Um, one of the, or how we uh, look at the cracking in correlation to the, the slab length and then in relationship to the radius of relative stiffness. We're really looking in and at dialing in on that ratio um, of being about 5.25, um, and L being the slab length um, over the uh, radius of relative stiffness. So basically, this graph shows you that, um, that um, as, your, as your thickness of your pavement increases, uh, the slab, uh, horizontal slab distance can also increase. So your joint spacing can go up, um, with that maximum being 15 uh, feet uh, joint spacing. Um, I, I read a geotech report one time and I got real excited because they quoted an ACI document. Um, and so uh, I, we kind of try to celebrate that when that happens. Uh, but then they then quoted ACI of saying a uh, 20 foot joint spacing. And my heart sunk because I think they got their, their uh, um, information crossed somewhere there. So we never really want to exceed 15 foot for your joint spacing. Um, and of course it's going to be less than that for those thinner pavements. Um, we're also going to see that the joint spacing is going to decrease as we get a, st a stiffer base. So those are, those are going to work against each other there. So the different types of joints, and many of you guys are familiar with this. So we've got our, our, uh, our contraction or our saw cut, also called our control. Those are the ones that we have control over their placement. Um, and there's the longitudinal um, down the, like a, a driveway, they're going in the, the route of traffic. Um, our construction, um, and we'll look at those here in, more in a minute, and then our isolation. I love um, ACI because they're very, very plain language. They like to name things exactly as they perform. Um, and so um, looking at the, the saw cut, so again, the depth, the depth is a, a quarter of the thickness um, for a minimum. So if you've got a four inch thick pavement, we want to take that joint down. Um, at least uh, an inch of the pavement. Um, we see a lot of um, work going on in the field, actually going to a third of the, the thickness of that slab. Um, and that's something, and, and uh, Eric in his um, presentation had the little business card um, slide that you can actually go and, and enter or insert into the joint to see how deep that joint is. And so that's a really neat little tool to have. Um, again, that's something that can cause cracking and it's something that's measurable. So if, you get, if you're looking at cracks or why, if you're kind of nerdy like I am, um, we, look at, we look down everywhere I walk. If I see a crack, I start evaluating, you know, first of all, the horizontal spacing. Is it, is it, is it that correct? And then how deep is it? So those are two things that we can measure. Um, early inch install is a little bit different um, on many occasions, but one of those being the thickness. Um, and there's their special guidelines by using the early entry saw. There's basically a sweet spot on when to um, saw cut or when to um, cut your joints. Um, you want to, if you get it on, if you get on the pavement too early, you have a higher potential for raveling, um, at the, especially at those joints. We want to really be careful um, that we don't do that. And then if we go too late, the stresses have already started to um, um, gather at the bottom part of the pavement, and so it's only a matter of time before the cracking comes to the surface. Um, so timing is of an essence to make sure that we've got it in the right time. 
And as you can see on the right side, this is what happens when we, um, it's, it's too late. And ACI is very, very specific about the timing um, for those joints to be cut. For standard pavement or uh, saws, uh, we're looking at within four to 12 hours after the, um, the final set or finishing. Um, with early entry, again, it's a little bit different. Um, you're looking in like the three to four hour range. And of course, that's gonna depend on a couple of different scenarios. Um, but this is really what I was talking about earlier. We have our saw cut here, and then we have that cracking surface. It looks like it's pretty and it's planned, and then we do have that cracking underneath. Um, again, an owner sees the picture on the left. They're absolutely fine because they're looking at it from the top. The owner sees the picture on the right, and we've got some issues there. Um, their pavement, in their terms, has failed. It's, it's not working. So I just mentioned that um, that paving window is it's four to 12 hours um, for conventional saws, around the three hours uh, for the early entry saw. Um, but it is, gonna, it is gonna be dependent on your weather, um, whether you've got, um, if you've got big temperature swings, you're starting to get in this time of the year when it can be extremely cold at night. Um, and then in the day uh, when the sun comes out, um, the temperature swings can be pretty dramatic. And that can have an effect on your pavement as well as far as the, the, the sawing window. Um, hot temperatures and sunny, I think that's always in, in the south. Uh, we are always dealing with that. Um, some of the temperatures that come out of Texas, that's probably something that you guys deal with a lot. Um, as far as uh, some subgrade and some base, sub base um, issues, that does have a um, factor that may then look at shortening that, that saw cut. So again, there's, there's a lot of uh, this information in the materials, the, the 325 guides, for you to go in and look and see how might th um, these types of um, issues or um, criteria change that window. So uh, some other ones, uh, concrete mixture, looking at your water demand um, and your aggregates. Um, and then some other things is, uh, your, that it's gonna have an, uh, an effect on is um, the existing lay, lanes and then the saw blade, your saw blade uh, selection. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. This is what I was talking about, I love ACI because it's talking isolation joints and the, the, the rules or the, the um, performance of isolation joints and they are, and their purpose is to isolate the, new, the fresh concrete from any fixed structure. Um, so if, you're, if you have a, a manhole, a column, anything like that, where you do not want the fresh concrete to butt up and basically connect itself permanently with that structure, you need to isolate it with isolation material. Um, a lot of times um, it gets interchanged with expansion joints, um, and those are two different, uh, um, uh, they're two different joints, um, but they are a lot of times in the field will be interchanged. Longitudinal joints, so say that you have an entrance going into a parking lot or you have a small street um, and you have that one longitudinal joint, again, the longitudinal joint being in the, the um, traffic um, flow, um, it can be used for a lane delineation. It is typically between 12 and 15 feet wide. If it is wider, if your lane is wider than 15, then we'll have to look at um, staggering those, those um, joints. But then they are tied together with tie bars. And with tie bars, no load transfer really happening, no significant load transfer happening with tie bars, but tie bars do exactly what their name states, they tie. They tie those two pavement panels together uh, to help with that, um, that uh, migration. This is the ACI uh, chart for tie bar design. For doweling is uh, not typically used in the lower volume uh, type designs, and with ACI 325 is an eight inch uh, thick pavement. If you start putting dowels in your, especially the round dowels in your thinner pavements, you have you do not have sufficient concrete coverage over those dowels, and so you'll have um, some potential there for cracking above it. Sealing or, or not sealing, there is a um, excuse me, there is a uh, website out there, seal sealnoseal.org, I believe it is. Um, but really, it's, it's, um, there's the different factors that go into it. I knew I, in the south area where I was uh, doing a lot of work, um, it was not, it, like nobody really wanted to do sealing. Um, I spent some time out west and they had some performance issues of people not maintaining them. Um, but it, there are some things to, to, 
to think about if you've got debris flow over or you know near your if you're by the beach you've got debris flowing in there if you have a valley gutter and you've got a joint uh, at the bottom of that you're going to have significant water flowing there that might be an area uh, that you really want to consider um, some sealing um, you want to make sure that if you choose the seal um, when you are when you cut a joint for a sealant you're you're actually doing a wider joint than what you would typically cut and so that's one thing that we always want to make sure that in, in our work that the owner understands that if you go ahead and you commit to, to a sealed joint, you need to make sure that you've got that um, built into your maintenance um, of whatever you're paving. Because again, you are, you are widening that joint and so you're asking for that stuff, that material is then to come into the joint if it's not maintained. So you want to make sure that it's cleaned um, before, it, uh, right after the saw cut and then before um, the sealant material gets put inside that joint. Um, as far as saw bl blades, you want to make sure that you've got the appropriate saw blade for whatever you're paving, um, as, and then as well as the material that's, that you're, you're using in your concrete. You want to make sure that the aggregates um, are, are well matched with that blade. As far as curing, curing, we know that curing is, is a necessity for concrete. Um, with the water and the cement hydrating, we want to make sure that we keep as much of that uh, water in the mix um, and that's what's going to give us our strength. And so um, we know that if we don't have um, adequate curing, we're going to have some higher potential for the, the plastic shrinkage cracking. Um, we also are going to have uh, our surface is not going to be as um, durable as it, as it would be if we had proper um, uh, curing. So some commonly basically following the manufacturer's recommendations as far as uh, how much the dosage and whatnot but we do like to see it fully uh, covering the, the concrete um, so it typically we'll see the, the pigments the the colored pigments so you can see exactly where that um, material is going um, I was always taught you take like a white sheet of paper and put it on the concrete and that's what we want to see uh, making sure that we get the sides um, as well if they are exposed Um, again, using the manufacturer's recommendation um, and then the pigmentation um, and uh, right after finishing. So I ran through that really quick to get us back on schedule. Does anybody have any questions? That's my job, is to get us back on schedule. That's what they told me. All right, thank you.